Tonight is our closing conversation of the year, though I would like to note that it was the very first topic I sought out experts for on the topic of repair, reparation, and refusal. And these two wonderful women sitting up here with me were the first scholars to say yes to having these conversations, even at a point when we really didn't know what those conversations would be like exactly. So thank you each for your early enthusiasm and um, show of trust in me to say yes for this event. Now, there are um, biographies of each of our experts on the website as well, but I'd like to remind you briefly um, that Hortense J. Spillers is the Gertrude Conway Vanderbilt Professor Emerita of English at Vanderbilt University. She has also taught at many locations, including Wellesley, Emory, and Cornell, and she's held many visiting positions in the United States and abroad. She is the recipient of so many prestigious awards and fellowships that I am not going to list them all here, but I do want to cite um, her election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Spillers is known to tens of thousands of students, if not more, through her editorship of the Norton Anthology of African American Literature. And she's revered by humanities scholars like myself for many concepts, including the idea of the scarred flesh as hieroglyphics, right? A traumatic grammar of the inherited racial injury of unknown horrors. Marianne Hirsch is the William Peterfield Trent Professor Emerita of Comer Comparative Literature and Women's and Gender Studies at Columbia University. She taught previously for many years at Dartmouth College, where she was my colleague, and where she co-founded with others a unique MA program in comparative literature. Professor Hirsch has served as president of the Modern Language Association and has won many awards and fellowships, including her as well, election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Hirsch's concept of post-memory, referring to a powerful and very particular form of memory of violent histories transmitted across generations, has been picked up and debated by scholars across the globe. These two women are inspiring teachers, mentors, colleagues, and writers, and I have had the very great privilege of interacting with each of our distinguished scholars at conferences and in many academic contexts, but I want to note, I think especially tonight with all the improvisation we're doing, that I have danced with Professor Spillers and I have played tennis with Professor Hirsch in, <laughs> let us say, our younger days. Okay, so, so now I get to switch to first names. Hortense, Marianne, welcome to 1014, specifically to Humanities for Humans. I'm so delighted that you're here. Okay, so with this, I'm going to um, switch to the other mic and we'll start what we hope will be a conversation. I did want to say one more thing. We welcome every single face in the audience, but I'm particularly delighted to see so many younger people. So thank you all very much for being here. <laughs> Okay. Hortense, I, this is a huge topic, and even though we've got a big reading list, when you think about repair, reparation, refusal, what, are, what comes to your mind? What is it that you just most would like to share with us? Well, I, the, the first thing I want to say is thank you <laughs> for putting this program together and for um, inviting me here, and I want to thank uh, Marianne for accepting an invitation uh, to this interlocution. When you put those three terms together, I think them together at the same time that I, that I think them separately. And I think probably in, in, in the course of uh, the remarks I'm, I'm, I'm going to make, we will see some opportunity for differentiating between especially uh, repair and reparation, because okay. it seems to me that uh, they are related, but then in some ways uh, they're, they're not related. Um, I cannot think of a more timely and urgent subject than uh, repair, reparation, and refusal, since it seems to me that uh, these three concepts touch the pulse 
of our collective anxiety now. Repair to our broken covenants that make possible a democratic republic, supposedly predicated on the rule of law. Reparation to communities long denied the full blessings of the rule of law and refusal to surrender to the totalitarian dangers and impulses that threaten to engulf us. We are indeed overwhelmed as it seems to me that the dizzying velocity of change matches nothing that we've seen before. I find myself constantly asking myself how I'm feeling and it must be the case that the inventory is not particular or peculiar to any one of us. What we share now, however, is not just our own worries and concerns, but this repertoire of matters that links us to a common destiny. In other words, uh, what happens to my neighbors impacts what happens to myself and vice versa, whether my neighbors and I like it or not, and we probably don't like it very much, but that's the way that goes. So this bond to my mind reminds me of a passage from Lincoln's first inaugural address delivered on 4 March, 1861, as we collectively revisit it as the nation of a young United States at another time of trial and stress, quote, the mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living hearth and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. Uttered by Lincoln on the eve of civil war, this discourse posits a collective destiny that has just been breached at the time Lincoln gave this address by seceding states, about seven of them, of what was then uh, a young United States, as Lincoln attempts to hang on to the idea of a United States of America. And as we all know, Lincoln could not get there without the next terrible four years of carnage and the dismantling of the slavery system. This was the second birth of the United States and some have wondered if we now, like the country then, face a third or fourth commencement of the American idea and what it will be. Then and now, what an American is and who counts compels us to crisis. And one of its most alarming and persistent features expresses itself in an arena of repair that has never been disassembled though it transfers across generations. And I refer here to the country's relationship to Africanity or to blackness. And from this social calculus, young black males have been on the receiving end of a severe protocol of discipline and punishment, of surveillance and containment that is nothing short of terrorism as political practice. Though there is nothing new about domestic terrorism and its obsessive pathological focus on black communities in the United States, it seems to me that the post-Obama era has engendered an aggrandizement of these crimes precisely in backlash against the first black president of the United States. Starting with Trayvon Martin's murder in 2012, followed by the police killings of Michael Brown in 2014, Eric Garner, the same year as Brown, 
Jordan Russell Brown in 2012. You might remember the young man in Florida who was playing his music too loud. Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old child, in 2014. Sandra Bland, 2015. Ahmad Arbery, 2020. George Floyd, 2020. Brianna Taylor, 2020. Tyree Nichols, 2023. These names do not by any means exhaust the roll call, but in its assemblage across age, gender, alleged offense, geography, circumstance, and above all, the relentless repetition of this species of crimes, these instances have suggested to me all over again the vulnerability, the utter precarity of Black life in the social and political context of the contemporary United States. But as I have said before, what affects my neighbor affects me. And now this vulnerability and this precarity may be shared by an entire society at large as each of us really becomes a military combatant, an unbidden one in a society that refuses to do anything about its guns. But perhaps a less often remarked outcome of these acts of homicide is that they have given rise to a veritable and unbidden sorority of mothers and wives brought together by the obscene notion that they lost their children far too soon and too violently. Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's mother, Lucy McBath, who's a congresswoman. I have a feeling she ran for Congress because in part her son had been killed. The mother of Jordan Davis, Gwen Carr, Eric Garner's mother, Geneva Reed Veal, Sandra Bland's <coughs> mother, Tamika Palmer, the mother of Breonna Taylor, Larsenia Floyd, the deceased mother of George Floyd, Samaria Rice, Tamir Rice's mother, <coughs> Leslie McSpadden, Michael Brown's mother, Wonder Cooper Jones, Ahmaud Arbery's mother, Rovan Wells, the mother of Tyree Nichols. This sorority of mothers could stretch back quite a long time if we evoked the history of lynch law in the United States. But among these figures, no tale is more poignant than that of one Mamie Elizabeth Till Mobley, who allowed the remains of her son Emmett Till to be opened to a shocked public gaze in 1955 in order, she said, for the world, quote, to see what they did to my baby. I think of these examples because they raise the question that U.S. society cannot precisely formulate, nor am I sure that I can do so either. And that is, what is the measure of value when dollar amount is inadequate? Or does an adequate amount, whatever that might be, repair a breach? Can these mothers of dead sons, for instance, ever be compensated for their loss? And if not, how do we translate human hurt into law? How do we translate the brokenhearted into judicial procedure. Might we say then that these matters lead us to wonder about the differences between repair and reparation? And I think that might be the question that I would put on the table. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a very powerful opening. And um, Mary Ann, when you hear that, what rushes into your heart and your head? Well, first of all, thank you for 
inviting me here, and thank, I want to thank everybody who organized this event. Um, and I particularly want to thank Hortense for this really <coughs> profound opening and conversation. Thank We've you, had some you. conversations over the years, but thank you. I think we're all. Can you hear me? Is this on? It's not on. Oh, it's not on. Sorry. Um, can you hear me? Sorry about that. I think we have to sit for a minute with, um, with these names, with these stories. I think we have to pause and take in this pain that we've been witnessing. And I think um, certainly in this room, trying to figure out what we could possibly do mm -hmm. and whether the ways we think in the academy, the theories we come up with, the stories, the histories we write, whether they can in any way um, be commensurate with this pain or help in any way. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't actually know exactly where to go from here because I think what you're describing is irreparable. I mean, does the term repair make mm -hmm. any sense at all? This is irreparable. I'm sorry. Can, you, can everybody hear me now? Yeah, okay, I'll speak up. I can't speak to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's irreparable, and um, I mean, this is these are repeated and unending cycles of violence that we've been witnessing in this country that persist not only across these Obama and post-Obama years, but have, that have persisted over centuries um, here, and that are re reactivated every day with new instances of violence. And when you name the years in which these occurred, and we see the multiplication of names in 2020 and 21 and 23 and so on. What, what, what could be commensurate? What kinds of actions, what kinds of reparative impulses could in any way do justice to all this? So mm -hmm. I feel, Hortense, that I've already learned so much from you about what in your, your classic essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe an American Grammar Book, you called the irreparable, you, you spoke about irreparability even in that early essay, and you talked about the irreparability of the high crimes against the flesh. And I think it's something that I would really like to come back to because when you spoke about irreparability, then I'm wondering, and I, I will do my own introduction, but I think we need to stay with this question about repair and reparation. When you talked about irreparability then, and enjoined us to change our language and our ways of thinking, telling us that this, what, what we need to do is really transform the grammar of our speaking in order to recognize and acknowledge what's actually happening. Yeah. So that when we say a word like family or kinship, when we say a word like body, these are words that only differentially affect part of the population and not the entire population. So, and I know we're talking about repair, reparation, and refusal, but the way I read your work is that your work is, is a work of refusal. Refusal to accept the status quo, to accept the ways that we've been writing history, the ways that we've been listening and quoting Lincoln's speech, the ways that we've been studying the history of racial violence in this country. So I guess I want to turn it back to you. <laughs> I'm supposed to turn it back to me. I think, I think an entire generation uh, asks those questions. I think what, what's, what's remarkable uh, from our vantage now about um, the 60s was that everything was in movement, right? I mean, a broad front. Of, of, of movements, um, young people, women people, um, people of color, black people, uh, people of different sexual orientation. I mean, I think that that whole era was an era of, of refusal. The Marcusean refusal, I think, gives its name to, uh, to our generation that is no longer dancing. <laughs> or running, 
but uh, we 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 imagine those things and we run and run and dance in in, in in different ways. So I think that 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 whole notion of um, refusal is one that's that's still very much alive um, in this society. Even though I guess I would admit I'd, I'd love to see more of it these days. Yeah. Yeah. Does does it help us think about the mothers? I think it. I, th I think it doesn't much help us think about uh, not only about the mothers, but uh, the continuing repetition of of such crimes. I mean, I even wondered at one time if I needed to write an open letter to somebody. I I didn't know who. Just an open letter to say, is there some conspiracy in inner sanctums of police departments? All of a sudden, that uh, black folk have become moving targets. I mean, every year or every six months, something happens. I mean, I really wondered, and I'm still not not wondering that question. If there has been some kind of smoke signal between uh, police departments about about this question, uh, I still wonder about that. So I don't. I don't think I don't think there is um, very much repair in that regard for mothers, but this reminds me of something that you'd said before, that uh, to have a conversation about it or to acknowledge that something has happened that needs to be acknowledged is a start. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's what uh, South African community had in mind when uh, it spoke of, um, well, not reparation, but what was the name of the reconciliation, reconciliation uh, committee mm -hmm. uh, or commission uh, that they were there to at least acknowledge um, that people were not making things up and fantasizing things about their history, that, that, that something enormous had happened that needed to be acknowledged. So, so I think perhaps at least that is the road to a, to a kind of repair of the breach, the repair of, of a violation. So a kind of uh, gesture to say, we acknowledge, we want to listen, right? Yeah. Um, and then, only then, can we maybe ask the question about change. I think maybe I can talk a little bit about why the notion of repair has become so important to me, and this is a slide actually from a project that I've been involved in, and some people here too, the Zip Code Memory Project, which was a pandemic, a pandemic project, and supposedly a post, it was supposed to be a post-pandemic project, um, that where the word repair and justice were our keywords. Um, Zip Code Memory Project, practices of justice and repair. And the, it, it, was an, it, it was in this part of New York City um, where a group of us, um, a collective of artists and activists and scholars got together acknowledging that the losses of the pandemic and the um, harm done by the pandemic was very differentially distributed in our neighborhoods. Uh, that it affected different people in very, very different ways. Mm. So I, I have a few pictures here. So I think what we saw is what we thought that there might be some economic compensation for people who had lost their livelihoods, their jobs, that there would be a need for mourning, but specifically that there would be a need for building community. And I, I don't even want to say rebuilding community, for living together in a space where it's become so clear that the injustices and the inequalities and the inequities among different populations in this very these very neighborhoods in Harlem and the South Bronx and Washington Heights were so differentially distributed. And what we did was really to um, convene groups, um, invite community members to come together and to um, use the arts to tell stories, to do theater workshops, to create things and make things together and to find ways to be together as a community in the interest of repair. And we thought that actually bringing people together as a community would be 
can you advance a little bit? Um, so listening, um, telling stories, collecting testimonies in groups, um, creating community um, became one way to engage in small practices of repair. And we thought that even listening and accompanying each other in these losses would be a way to begin to repair. So first, repair because first of all, it acknowledges that something is broken. The system was broken. We were angry and furious. People were enraged at how badly we were harmed by a system that wasn't working. And it's not just healthcare, it's everything. Um, so it acknowledges that something is broken, but it does not aim to repair the damage. It aims to engage in small practices of care and mutual aid to build on networks of care and mutual aid that already existed. So in my own work, which has been very much under the paradigm of trauma in my work on the Holocaust and on the transmission of other violent histories across generation, I've learned so much from working in different parts of the world with, I've learned a lot about, not just about trauma, but about survival and precisely about possibilities of healing um, and about community building and about transformation and change, about precisely what you said about vulnerability mm -hmm. and how a shared vulnerability, the acknowledgement of a shared vulnerability that still is differentially distributed could help us somehow move forward. So I found that the notion of, re I, I sort of totally acknowledging traumatic histories that get repeated, I've looked for ways to, to interrupt the unending cycles of traumatic return mm -hmm. and find ways to envision change and transformation. And the, the term repair became helpful because Trauma is very much about the victim and the survivor's experiences. And it's mm -hmm. totally important to listen to those and to create a space where those can be aired. So in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the first was testimonies by victims about what they had suffered, and that was really important. But then came also the necessity to um, take responsibility for the harm. So the term repair to me and, and, and thirdly, reparation. So those were like three, three arms of the TRC, which could be a kind of model for how to think about this. Um, a space to tell, us, to, to tell the story and to create stories, make them part of a national narrative. And I think the names you mentioned, which are names that we all know, are ways to, to call attention to what's going on and make them part of a national conversation. But then also the acknowledgement of and the resp responsibility for the perpetration. So the term repair to me is helpful because it's not just about the testimony of vic victims and survivors' experiences, mm -hmm. but it's a, also a call or a claim to, um, to take responsibility and to demand justice. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many forms of justice, of course. Restorative justice is what the, TIA, the South African Truth Commission chose. Um, but it's, it's a multi-pronged, um, uh, it, it, repair opens up a kind of um, different dimensions to the perpetuation of traumatic histories and possibly a way to interrupt something with small gestures, small acts, small practices that have to keep being reiterated and continued rather than and and the you know the in in a collectivity and in a community and it seems to me that um, something about those small acts um, is related to a word you've used I've heard from you many times about resilience the idea also of recognizing resilience of these communities that are under impossible attack and I think, Hortense, that a lot of your work has been pointing to these cultural objects, whether literature or something else, that were really created out of the resilience of a Black community in this country that was under such profound attack 
for so many centuries, right? And yet somehow there was this resilience, somehow there was this ability to have community to create. When you use the word sorority, for example, sorority of mothers, I don't know if that's something you'd like to pick up on or... Um, well, the yeah, the, the the resilience of um, all those mothers over all those generations is really quite uh, quite remarkable, right? And I suppose that it's that uh, that resilience that's translated into modes of survival, mm -hmm. and perhaps even flourishing occasionally in those communities that um, should have been by right, I guess, wiped out a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But somehow they keep hanging on. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has something to do with, with, what, with what you're calling uh, resilience mm -hmm. and what those very mothers have passed on uh, to, to, their, to their communities yeah. and surviving children. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's stick with mothers. I think Marianne, you have well, some more to say. Well, can I just mothers. say? Yeah. I don't actually love the term resilience. And oh, I'm okay. Sorry. You've heard oh, me yes, use I it. Yes, I have. You heard you say it. So okay. I'm sorry right, to okay. just say. Can we go to the next one? You know, I worry that the term resilience puts so much pressure and responsibility on the people who are suffering. Mm -hmm. And you know, you just have to be strong and get through it. And that's what it implies to me. That too. Mm -hmm. And I like yeah. the term vulnerability that you yeah. use because. There's no, there's no um, responsibility to be resilient and to be a model and to be a hero with so much violence being inflicted. I think we yeah. need something else. We need a call to justice. We need action. We need you know, to support each other mm. to make a change. So I don't love that term. I've never actually liked it, but you I hope other it, people but, yeah. will. Um, yeah. You know, so... Um, I'm not saying that these mothers aren't resilient because they're incredibly resilient, but I don't want I, to I give the impression that yeah. everybody's supposed to be resilient through ha having to, to through suffering such sure. uh, violence. Mm -hmm. So I, I was gonna, you know, I brought a <laughs> couple of slides from the mothers uh, from a, some different mothers' movements mm -hmm. because I think we're beginning to have there are a number of mothers' movements in the United States as well, of course, mothers against drunk driving, mothers against gun violence, every mm -hmm. town. Um, I mean, so many mothers' movements. And I think there's, a, there's obviously a reason for that. But when you name the mothers that you've named today, these are individuals. And yet the mothers in, um, in Argentina who have been marching since 1977, mm -hmm. protesting the enforced disappearance by the dictatorship of their children, and then um, I've also had the chance to sit with the Saturday mothers slash people in Istanbul um, in on Galatasaray Square, where um, it's a mother's movement because it comes out of a feminist ethos and a feminist tradition. Mm -hmm. But of course, men are, men are involved too. And these movements, um, especially the slogan that the mothers in Argentina use, used and still use and now grandmothers um, is aparición con vida. We want them back alive. Mm -hmm. So they, you, you took them alive, we want them back alive. So I don't actually know what to call this contradictory statement except to call it an act of refusal. We are not going to accept these deaths until we see the bodies. This is about disappearance and it's about disappearance that erases even the memory of these people <coughs> having existed. So bringing ID photos is, they're here. They're here with us. They're still here. Um, until that happens and until justice is served, mm -hmm. until we have trials, until we have accountability. So this statement, which is an act of refusal, is a way to create a movement out of, you know, a movement of mothers um, you know, there's a lot to say about why mothers and uh, why that's effective. The way it happened in Buenos Aires is that um, when women put on scarves and they mourn the death of their children, it's harder to arrest them and to shoot them. It's more, you know, they have more authority in mourning. Um, we 
you know, it's hard not to stand with them in some ways. Um, but so this becomes a political, they, be, they become political actors. But I think this idea of the aparición con vida about we want them back alive as an act of refusal acknowledges the, the rift between where we are and where we want to be right. somehow that we're, we're sitting in within this contradiction. And I think that's sort of the contradiction that we're all in here, which is that how can we accept these deaths and this, the perpetuation of this violence? We can't accept it, yet we live with it. So somehow in that rift between those two, we have to figure out how to think, which feels rather impossible most days. Right, so I was very taken today learning actually from Marianne about this new um, video installation at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art called From the Deep Wake of Grexia, or someone can correct my pronunciation of that, but this African-American artist who wants to recognize all those mothers and babies or pregnant women who were just thrown overboard as those ships made their way from the African continent to uh, the American continent. And I think through art, doing some of the things that we're talking about, doing acknowledgement, um, trying to give some kind of presence to those who are completely lost to us. We can't find those bodies, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know where those skeletons are. Um, and yet through art, trying to mark the existence of those horrific deaths, right? Yeah. Um, and um, I accept for sure what you said about resilience, but I would also say through art, we're creating something that gives a life to something we otherwise would have no contact to if, mm -hmm. if you might accept that mm -hmm. formulation on my part. Yeah. I was very moved by that, and it just opened in Washington, D.C., so hopefully some of us will see it very soon. Yeah, great. Now, um, we started at a funky time, um, so we're allowed to have a little more time for ourselves. I'm, I'm just wondering if we want to go a, a little bit um, into the issue of, we talked about acknowledgement, we talked about listening, uh, we talked about refusal, um, we have a lot of memorials in this country. We have a lot of gestures that call themselves uh, memorialization. Um, we have this very, very moving site trying to talk about the horrific uh, violence that um, has been put under the shorthand of, of lynching in, the, in this country, right? Um, is there a role, does memorialization help anything? Or as James Young has said, does it allow us to just forget? We put up the memorial or we make a memorial uh, gesture and then that means we're okay now, we did our job and we can just forget it. Is, is there a role that we need to memorialize whether it's the COVID deaths or the continued deaths due to state and police violence? Um, you know, that's... Um... That's almost, I wouldn't say, I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, the right word. Um, that question goes through my mind quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking about memorialization, I was, I was thinking about that. Um, I recently saw a symphony about an opera about uh, about slavery, perhaps there are people in people in this audience who have seen the Jonah people uh, by a trumpeter, a jazz trumpeter, um, Hannibal, I think Lacumbe yeah. is his name, and I thought about I thought about the opera whose music. I thought was really terrific, and uh, other parts of it, uh, I would I would say they, they they were kind of mixed. I mean, the music was really terrific, but you know, I I think of that opera in connection with something that that I've called before new slavery studies, hmm. uh, and it is as if 
all thinking about Africanity in our context starts there. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different starting place from where the uh, the Afrocentrists start, mm -hmm. right? But the, the, the Black Studies people start with, uh, with, 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 with New World slavery. And I have often wondered, is there any such thing as over-memorialization? Because in some ways, um, that gesture could be. I'm not saying that it is inherently or necessarily a stop sign, but in some ways it might invite people to stop in the sense that um, if you can memorialize, it's as if you, you've paid a certain debt mm -hmm. and we can stop now, we can go home, we can put our toys away or mm -hmm. we can stop tinkering and thinking and acting and refusing Right, I mean, we can we can do something else. So I think that I think that's a very good that's a very good question, mm -hmm. even though it's uh, unorthodox and cheeky and all of that. I think it's I think it's a very good question. It's a good but, question for New York because there are lots of memorials. So I, yeah, over memorialization. I so. What's your reaction I, to that? Yes, the we word. can definitely over memorialize. I think it can do a lot of damage. So. First of all, when you build a monument, you, I mean, the implication is it's over. Now we memorialize it. That's a, what that How do you memorialize um, harm and a, a history that's ongoing? Yeah. Can you memorialize that? Yeah. You know, there was a movement in, in, in relation to the Holocaust in the 1980s of the counter memorial, yeah. the counter monument. And these counter monuments were precisely meant to interrupt this, you know, the and you know, of course, not just you know in 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 Europe and in Germany, but Maya Lin's memorial to the Vietnam War was already a counter monument. It wasn't big, it you know it was to the ground. It had a slash in the ground. It meant something was broken that could not you know breach that could not be repaired. It had the names. I mean, so this was a already a very very different approach to memorialization. And these counter monuments could be can be very very powerful because. They show you precisely that you know memorialization is not finished. That just having a memorial doesn't mean that it's finished. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's been a real and and it was um, these counter monuments and memorials are acts of critical memory, memory that continues and that the questions have to keep being asked. I found that in the last 10, 20 years, there's a movement again to monumentalization, monumental memorials. Mm -hmm. Every city wants to have a Holocaust memorial or a Holocaust museum, um, and they have to be bigger than the you know the one in Amsterdam has to be there because there's one, you know, in Paris, and the one in has, Paris has to be bigger because there's one in Berlin, and you know, so this impulse to compete for how well we memorialize can be really be a problem, mm -hmm. and we're in a moment of memory wars. I mean, we textbooks are being withdrawn. Um, children's books are being censored by Scholastic. We, you know, there's a lot of history that can't be told, and memorials made in stone um, have a certain narrative, but the narrative shifts. So, how do we memorialize? How do we create memory that stays alive? rather than assuming that it's over. And I would, I would also want to make a distinction uh, between uh, counter memorialization, is that what you called it? Mm -hmm. And uh, right wing retrenchment, mm -hmm. which creates moral equivalence between um, things that are not Moral equivalence. I think we want to be. I think we want to be careful there because it could be there is a way that over memorialization can be read as something that says, "Oh, well, it didn't happen," mm -hmm. and that's not that's not that's not what we're saying. That slavery didn't happen, or the Holocaust didn't happen. That's not 
what you're saying at all. But I can all I can I can see that um, a reactionary impulse would want to turn memorialization itself into acts of reification, mm -hmm. and therefore something that is uncritical in order to say the opposite thing. So I think we I think we have to be I think we have to be careful to say what we mean when we talk about uh, critical critical memory, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think agree. it's very important to uh, to keep that in mind. I couldn't there's a agree lot of more that. because me memory is not necessarily progressive. I mean, memory is being yes. used to reactivate old nationalisms, exactly. you know, very easily and ethnocentrism. I mean, it can easily be turned that way. Exactly. Um, yes. And then when it yes. becomes coercive, yes. then there's always resistance against it. So I, I could not agree more. So I, you know, I brought a slide of the stumbling stones that are all over Europe. I'm sure that everybody here has heard of this form of memorialization, mm -hmm. um, which is very local. And uh, it's, they're put up in front of the last residence of people who've been persecuted by the Nazis, not just Jews, but also Roma Sinti and political prisoners. And these are locally um, installed. Um, their hands um, carved or etched so that it doesn't become rote or you know, um, automatic in, in any way. Uh, communities are encouraged to come together and to install them together. And it means that if you live in that house, you stumble across, you have to walk across that stone um, mm -hmm. every single day. And I was thinking if in this country mm -hmm. we could install stumbling stones in places where racial violence has happened or monuments, mm -hmm. m m small memorials that would be reminders, but also would interrupt the flow of daily life saying, we have to, we have to remember, and we have to come to terms with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd be littered with these. I mean, we yeah. could build our whole cities out of these. Um, Just looking at the time, um, we did want to hear a bit from the audience. What's on your mind? I'm going to stand up, and each of you would get time at the end. So, still, if there's a topic that you feel like you haven't had a chance to. Um, address just yet. Yeah, I should bring it with me so I don't drop it, I guess. Um, so what we were hoping was just um, if someone has a very specific question, something you could formulate, um, hopefully briefly, that could be addressed to a specific expert um, tonight or to either of them. Um, does anyone have something? There's obviously so many topics we didn't get a chance. And I, I would start with younger folk. I think that's a hand. Yeah. Um, my question for you, and I'm curious to hear about the role of prison abolition in reparations and whether it can be complete without addressing that. <laughs> Thanks so much for bringing up incarceration. Yeah, would either of you oh, like to? Goodness. You want to say more about uh, prison abolition? I mean, I guess it's a huge part of the conversation. So yeah. To say that, uh, you know, slavery has never been really fully abolished as we have prisons and mass incarceration. Um, mm. My background is in race and gender health equity, and I used to work in um, the community social justice program in, in NYCHA. So I, I mm. like, uh, it's a big hand of worms, but if you look into you know, conversations by Angela Davis, Marianne Acaba, mm -hmm. and so many more um, in between them, it's all documented, it's all it's all rooted to racism and wealth inequality, and we can't really heal if that system is still creating damage. Um, but then also, there's conversations about is justice um, like punishment, is justice vengeance, is justice um, what's the word I'm looking for? Retribution, or is it healing? How do we address harm? Mm -hmm. without addressing injustice and how, how do we break that connection between um, I guess revenge and dealing with us a, 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 a replacement for justice yeah so where would you begin I mean I don't know where I don't even know where to, where to start answering that question because so much of what happens with uh, 
the whole concept of, of, of prison is predicated on uh, what happens before you get to prison, right? I mean, it really is predicated on, on the, the system of justice that you build, which is, in, which is based on what you do about laws and how you make laws and all of that. So it's, it, it's, um, it really is an enormous question that feeds into everything about, about everything else. But do you have a solution <laughs> in mind? <laughs> I don't have like a one answer or one a one sentence answer, but I think um, in conversations about healing and conversations <coughs> about you know focusing on how all the words that are taking my mind was really what I today on today. Um, I guess shifting the narrative from you know punishing the person who caused harm because often they have been harmed themselves, and we all know that. Yeah. A lot of our system is uh, corrupt, I guess is a, a, a short word for it. I, I guess if we had, you know, thirteen billion more dollars for the New York City budget, there's a lot of ways that could help people. Um, but at the same time, I think it's really easy to you know, see the people who cause this violence and cause the harm in, in terms of like racial justice or racial violence and and, and genocide, and like those people who caused that harm need to be punished. And I, I guess yeah. <laughs> there's just so many different layers to it, but I, I think are. at the end of the day, yeah. you know, but I, I think that yeah. I think that the connections you make are the really important connections. So um I was just in Montgomery at the uh, legacy Museum, mm -hmm. and the narrative of the Legacy Museum is really from slavery to mass incarceration, and and the you know the narrative of the you know it's a really powerful story and a powerful installation to show that it it's just shifted forms, but it's the same system of racialized violent violation of black bodies from you know you have this brief moment of emancipation and reconstruction and then there's lynching and you know the flight from the south and then there's um the death penalty i mean for you know there's jim crow there's the death penalty that's you know distributed so un unevenly and, and then there's mass incarceration and that's the narrative of the museum so i think making that clear and not just in montgomery but everywhere that this is part of a continuing narrative of violence, acts of violence, you know, that's already, that's already would be important. What's heartbreaking is that you're in that museum and you realize that in those very places, you can't even teach the history this way anymore because mm -hmm. the textbooks are being withdrawn and, and, um, and the, the courses are being policed. So that's, that's where, you know, I get really hopeless that education is changing. But I think making the connections you're making is already a very important absolutely insight. right and books like the new jim crow that really explain the phenomenon of mass incarceration to people who are not directly affected by it mm -hmm. i would also bring up the very many um, efforts to change bail laws and to provide money so that people can make bail because in a lot of states like Florida, people just are put in prison because there's no way they can make the bail, right? So I think recognizing those small efforts, speaking of small efforts, is incredibly important that people are targeting specific states, particularly communities um, where the vast majority of individuals who are being put in prison just because they can't make bail for not paying parking fines. <laughs> you, you have a nice slide for us. Yeah, I'll, I'll say about it. So um, just the, the question is whether um, we limit ourselves in just talking about national borders in terms of reparations. When we look at slavery, it happens across the American uh, colonization, the same thing. There's a certain number of countries in Western Europe that here that benefited from these systems. Um, um, yeah, just like what, what happened when you consider 
slavery and colonialism and genocide as products of white supremacy and colonialism. What is there any interesting work that you're looking at that looks at uh, the transnational nature of these struggles and transnational calls for reparations or justice? <laughs> <laughs> so small. Uh, very small. Yeah. Has there been a movement to look at reparations globally? Yeah. There's it would make it would make sense if we think of of, of reparations in uh, in in the global sense or a transnational sense. I think that's I think that's right. Even though I suspect that the most trenchant conversations will still take place within national borders, and particularly. Uh, Within this, within within this country, even though, logically speaking, uh, it was certainly not just something that happened here or in the New World complex. I mean, it really was a, a global phenomenon. So I think that's, I think the the logic of it is correct. But practically speaking, or politically speaking, I think it'll probably be limited, pretty much to uh, to the United States. Although we've had conversations in Germany trying to put together um, the Holocaust mm -hmm. and colonialism, right, and I German see. colonies. And there's a lot of pushback on that. Yeah. This is where over memorialization is a problem because the yeah. Holocaust has so dominated the discourse the in, in, yeah. in Germany and in Europe more generally that, you know, colonialism, you know, is, it's difficult to, you know, kind of put these things together. Yeah. So I, I think that. That's one problem. Rich Blood had a question. I think he. I think Rich and. and You know, I, I, I think one thing that uh, does not happen often enough in this society is the recognition that um, freedom is, is difficult and that um, we have not definitively earned it and that this lack of the a, a definitive solution 
to the problem of freedom stretches across the racial divide. And the only way that I can say what I mean is to, uh, is to give an example. When you burn books, when you make ideas, or when you make thinking unpopular, you hurt your own children. You're not just hurting black children. I mean, it, 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 it's very easy for the society, figuratively speaking and symbolically speaking, to do what is always done with black life, and that is to scapegoat it, to send it into battle as a sacrificial figure or a sacrificial lamb without recognizing what it's doing to itself. I think it's Morrison who is as concerned, or one of her concerns in playing in the dark is what happens to the one who commits the act. The racial subject versus the racial object. Yeah, exactly. So you're and yourself, right? Yeah. So my so my point there is that people who take refuge in whiteness in the society are making a mistake. It is an error. You are not liberated yet. You are not free yet until I am and until my children are. And once when that happens, then you will be happier too. That you can't keep shooting my father and my brother and my lovers in the back and think that's okay, that you're gonna walk away scot-free. You will not. I can assure you, I think, I can, <laughs> I think, and I'm not trying to play God or anything, but I just kind of think that's the way it works. That we are in that we are involved in a kind of social contagion. If I catch a cold, you catch a cold. You catch a cold, I get the flu, all right? Whatever. I think that really is right, that there really is such a thing that you can use those terms to talk about our sociality. But for so long, the perfect storm of victimage in the society have been the descendants of formerly enslaved people. And people have been content to say, well, okay, if we can acknowledge that we did wrong there and maybe have a few memorials there, that, 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 that that's the end of it. And that we're always saved by our whiteness. That's not, that's not so. I mean, all the idols have fallen. All of them, the I-D-O-L-S's and the I-D-Y-L-L-S's, all of them have gone. I was 81 years old two weeks ago, and I have never, I have not ever seen anything like what we're living through ever in my life. And I grew up in the South, the big bad South that was ending apartheid. I grew up in that and I saw it end. And I thought, oh, well, I've gotten through my life. <laughs> and so I discover a few years ago when so many women in the United States said, I will not vote for Hillary Clinton. I despise her. And I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. That's when I said, okay, let me look, let me peep. Let me look at my whole card here, because that's not the way that's supposed to work. Or uh, looking at a Clarence Thomas, who always votes against the interest of black people. So, you know, you can't depend on being on the gender thing anymore. You can't depend on the race thing anymore. Everything has been revealed, all right? That's, why not, that, that, that's all I'm saying, that all of those heroic, things and figures and images that we had in our heads have proved uh, that they're not going to get us through this life. So my only point with saying that is that we have to keep thinking, we have to keep working, we have to keep 
the we keep we have to keep the dialogic motion going. You, we have to remember at the same time that we have to do something other than and in addition to remember. I think that's the answer to the question. And that nothing is going to save us outside ourselves so that everybody is right, starting with the, the chaplain of the United States Senate, when he says to people who say, you're in my thoughts and prayers to the next gun shooting victims, if thoughts and prayers are not enough. But that's, that's, that, that's not enough. And so um, I think that means that the 80 year olds are gonna have to get back on um, the firing line or the firing squad or the next demonstration in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm gonna have to be there, arthritis or not. I mean, I think that I think that's what it means. That it's not over, right? It isn't over, and that um, we are still in the midst of being critical, first of all, of ourselves, being critical of the movements that we believe in, being critical of the ideas that we embrace, being critical of our heroes, so that we are in effect. I think, always out of place, we are always looking sideways at the anti-heroes because we share in that a little bit. We I mean, were always skeptical of uh, whatever, whatever, whatever idols we we raise. We can't. Uh, we have to be critical of that of that stuff and not just uh, what we regard as our own other. I think that's I think that's what that means, and I think that's what Baldwin and Morrison uh, and and other critical figures uh, have been have been after. That we have not earned the right to be comfortable in this world yet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even if I am a hundred. And I say that <laughs> so that I can stop counting, right? <laughs> I don't have to say every April 24th. Oh, okay. What's the next birthday? Okay, I'm 100 years old. We could just leave it at that. Okay. So we're not we're not comfortable here in this veil of soul making. One great poet called it. We still we we're still about that. We're still on that journey, on that path. Don't forget it. I don't care how left or radical we think we are. It's 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 never not enough. It's never enough. So that's that's what I that's what I would say to parasitical whiteness, uh, Rich. That uh, give it up, give up, give it up, <laughs> give it up. It's not doing you any good. <laughs> it's not gonna save you. Now I promised you each a moment. If there was something that you really had hoped to say this evening that you didn't get a chance to say, we are kind of out of time. But I promised you that. So, um, no, I can't. Did we hit some? I, can't, most I of think those? we hit all the the all ones you the wanted to. Okay, yeah, so much yeah. the better. How about you, Marianne? Was there another image you? Well, I want to echo what Hortense said. We got to get out on the street. You know what okay. happened in 2020. We were all isolated in our houses and were afraid to go out and even breathe on each other. And then George Floyd happened and yeah. people got out on the street and built a movement. And yeah. what, why are we not on, out on the street every day right now protesting racial violence and everything. bans on abortion and you know everything else that's happening? And I think we have to stay out there and do that. Um, so I just want to echo what you said. Um, yeah. and, uh, Fight parasitical whiteness, too. <laughs> Great. So um, I can't thank each of you enough, and I'm about to let them uh, applaud you in the way you deserve to be applauded. I just want to mention that um, this is the conclusion of the first season of Humanities for Humans, and we are hoping to have a full season next year with a fall program in this space and two online programs and hopefully um, a year from now a final session. Um, thank you all so much. I believe there might be, um, looking for our hostess, there might still be some refreshments for those of you who didn't get it. But certainly, um, before we go anywhere, I just can't thank you enough. Thank you both so much. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.